Welcome to our online worship at Green Valley Evangelical Lutheran Church. On the church's homepage, www.gvelc.com, you will find underneath the um, video of today's service uh, various buttons. One, you can retrieve a copy of today's sermon. Another one can uh, will lead you to a copy of today's worship service. And the third one is a button for donations. If you wish to donate through PayPal, or through the online credit terminal, they will direct you to that. We thank you for being with us today. We sing our opening song. you from Zion. He is the maker of heaven and earth. This morning we rejoice to worship our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift of grace that we come into your presence and offer true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you, and in the life to come, give us the fulfillment of what you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The word from God's prophet is recorded in Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 and 6 through 8. The Lord is Lord of all. This is what the Lord says, Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. This is the word from God's prophet. The psalm for the day is Psalm 133 and 134. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Mount Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. This is the psalm for the day. The word from God's apostle is recorded in Romans chapter 11, reading selected verses from 13, verse 13 onward. God has mercy on all. I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake, but as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have become disobedient in order that they may, too not, they may now too receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. This is the word from God's apostle. The word from God's son, the gospel, is recorded in Matthew chapter 15, beginning at verse 21, the woman of Sidon. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and is suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. 
and her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing the hymn of the day. I bring you a message of grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God before us today is the Gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. 
This is the word of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, the magic is gone. Oh, not that I've lost my touch with my youngest grandson, Gunner. He still perks up when he hears me singing on the phone. Put your hands up, hooray. Put your hands up and say, put your hands up. It's going to be a great day with Gunner and Bergen and Mommy and Daddy and Bali. But I can't play peekaboo with him anymore. He's grown out of it. At seven months, he knows things don't cease to exist just because you don't see them. They call that object permanence. <laughs> yeah, for this we pay scientists good money. Now, if a seven-month-old knows that things don't cease to exist simply because you can't see them, how is it that we don't know God doesn't cease to exist when we can't see him. Look, take a look at Matthew's account of Jesus walking on the water and see what I mean. It is Jesus. Jesus sends us, Jesus comes to us, Jesus rescues us. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Jesus had just finished feeding the 5,000. Matthew doesn't tell us things were starting to get ugly, but he does tell us that Jesus loaded him and the other disciples onto the boat and sent them off pronto. But like everything else that day, things start unraveling here too. The calm which had settled upon the lake that whole day had now turned. A wind came up from the west, a strong wind blowing straight in their faces and with a single sail. They had no chance. They, they take the sail down and they start rowing, making little headway. They are stuck in the middle of the lake, trying, rowing with all their might, trying to get a little bit of a forward motion so they can point the boat directly into the waves rather than having the waves turn the boat on its side and then capsize it. Wet and tired. I mean, they had sailed across the lake early that morning, and now it's almost dawn the next day. Why had they listened to Jesus? And where was Jesus? On the mountainside, all by himself, praying. When we talk about being sent by Jesus, we instantly put a churchy touch on it. We are sent into the Lord's mission field. We are sent to spread the word. We are sent to teach God's people the gospel in Sunday school or in vacation Bible school. Our missionaries are sent to a foreign country or, or sent to start a church in the United States. Oh, the glory and grandeur of it all. What a great adventure. But Jesus sends each and every one of us every day into the world. He sends us into our children's bedroom to wake them up and get them into something presentable so they don't look like they were raised by wolves when it comes time for the online class to start. Jesus sends us to work even though we put our health at risk. Jesus sends us into our marriages where we we have to eat crow and say we're sorry for the mean things we, we said once or twice to our spouses, and by once or twice we meant a couple of hundred times. It sure doesn't seem like Jesus has sent us. It's not grand and glorious. It's, it's a grind. It's a chore. We feel like we're all alone, forgotten, 
and overlooked. Oh, that is a fertile field for the devil. Where is your Lord now? He says to us, how could God let you go through this day after day? Does he even exist? And we sort of play into the devil's hands by acting as if God didn't exist in the non-churchy things. Oh, it wasn't a big enough deal to pray over. We think that we made the choices that got us into the jam we're in, so we might as well live with it. An insightful, if not particularly theologically sound movie once pictured hell as a place where everybody was resigned to everything falling apart. So they never did anything about it. They were just victimized more and more every passing day. Don't make your life hell. Things can change. Things weren't meant to be this way. Jesus had a purpose for sending us into this world, and that good purpose still stands. It is Jesus. Jesus sends us. It is Jesus. Jesus comes to us. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. God is a great boss, a terrible boss, sends you poorly trained and poorly equipped out to a job. And then when things go wrong, that bad boss is nowhere to be found. God is a great boss. He trains us, he equips us, but the best part about God is that he comes to us. Now I could stop right here and simply spend the rest of this sermon reading all the passages in the Bible that point to God's abiding presence with his people. Don't you remember how Matthew's gospel ends? Jesus says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Or what God said to Joshua, never will I leave you, never forsake you. Or think of King David's psalm, I saw the Lord always before me, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Ah, but those are just words. We can't see it. Fair enough. Evidently, object permanence doesn't apply when it comes to God. And I hope you noticed the sarcasm in my voice. God comes to us in ways that we can see. In fact, in ways that we can touch and feel and even taste. He comes to us in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. Through the words of Jesus, through the eating, through the drinking, Jesus gives us his true body and blood. In baptism, Jesus comes to us as he pours out his spirit in the water through the word. That's the whole point of the sacraments. God comes to us with his gift of forgiveness through earthly elements which we can see according to his word. And if he comes to us through the sacraments, we know he also comes to us through his words and promises not attached to earthly elements. So we confidently sing, keep me, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me, hide me in the shadow of your wings. It's a matter of faith, not sight. Well, the reaction of the disciples shows why God does not come to us visibly with his unveiled glory. They see Jesus walking to them on the water and they think it's a ghost out to destroy them. But it's understandable. They've been up a long time now, almost 24 hours. They've worked hard and the whole day has been an emotional roller coaster ride. When you think God has left you high and dry, 
This is always where our instincts take us. A ghost! We're goners! God hides himself from us to protect us. Just as a welder dons that helmet with the smoke glass to protect his eyes from that glare of the torch, just because we can't see him doesn't mean he isn't there. It is I. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what today or tomorrow holds. Jesus comes to us. Don't be afraid of the health scare that is surrounding us and that embitters so many of our days. Jesus comes to us. It is Jesus. Jesus rescues us. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Well, Peter's a lot like us. He's still not sold, but he's willing to be convinced. It would be nice if all of this were true, but how can I be certain? Peter's gutsy, he proposes a test. Tell me to come to you on the water. Fair enough, Jesus thinks. Come. And all goes well. Peter is walking on the water too. Miracles are for the disciples also. But when Peter thinks about how crazy this all is, and he sees the wind and the waves all around him, this can't be real. This can't be real, he thinks. He sinks like a stone and cries out, Lord, save me. Now we see the grace of God. If it were you and I, well, we would have walked away in disgust. How much more do we have to do to prove to these people that this is real? Peter would have drowned. Good thing we aren't God. Jesus immediately reaches out. There's no hesitation, no agonizing wait. He pulls Peter up out of the water, and they get into the boat. And now a miracle takes place for the disciples as well. The wind immediately dies down. The sea is calm. They are saved. It is Jesus. Jesus rescues them. They know it. They've seen it. They worship him. He is the Son of God. Experience is a hard teacher. Lots of grief, lots of anxiety, lots of sleepless nights. Maybe you're going through that right now, especially with school in whatever shape it's going to take about to start. Will the children be safe if they're going to school? Will they be safe at home? Will they learn? How will you be able to juggle everything? It was hard enough when life was normal. But now, what are the rules when nothing is normal? The stress is making us snap. At times, we are on edge. At other times, it just feels like we're sinking beneath the load with less and less strength and Resiliency to cope with the same problems yet another day. Lord, save me. Peter didn't think about it. It just came out. Jesus, Peter didn't make a list of pros and cons. His faith leapt into action. He went to the only one who could help. The only one who could rescue him. Hey, you know how... Uh, the pros, the sport pros, practice and practice and practice. They, they do that to develop, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, muscle, muscle memory, muscle memory. It comes without thinking. 
thinking only goofs it up. Thinking only goofs up that golf swing or that batter swing or, or that follow through on the basketball free throw line. Faith develops that spiritual muscle memory in us. Faith drives us to our Lord and Savior time and time again. There is no other help. There is nothing I can do. But there is help. There is someone who can do something about it. Lord, save me. And Jesus does. He always does. If we would look back over our life with an open Bible in our hand, we could see the countless times the Lord has rescued us. He rescued us from the consequences of our bad choices. He rescued us from ourselves. He rescued us from all those around us who wanted to crush us and rejoice over our fall. He rescued us from illness. He brought us through that operation. He saw us through that accident. He brought us through days that, that turned out to be not nearly as happy as we thought they were going to be. Jesus rescued us, and he brought us to this place, to this time. He has done it so we can trust in his saving power even more, so we can see that he is always at our right hand. He has done this so that we will not be led astray or believe that somehow we're already living in heaven, so why bother looking for another one? He has brought us to this point so he can continue to work his good to us and through us to others. It's not a game of peekaboo he's playing because we have outgrown that. It's his plan to strengthen us and cause us to stand uplifted by his omnipotent hand. It is Jesus. Jesus sends us. Jesus comes to us. Jesus rescues us. So do not be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and crafty cunning of deceitful scheming Instead, grow up into Christ, the head of the church, of which we all are his body. Go where he sends us, receive him who comes to us, and rejoice in his daily and eternal rescue. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Trust. 
Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessing to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, let there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, and disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. Protect those who travel by land, sea, and air. We pray especially that you keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless those who serve you at this place. Give them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring all these requests before you, dear Lord, and ask you to hear us. But above all, we give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Take what we have, gracious God, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our possessions and offerings, and use them to your glory. We ask this for Jesus' sake. In his name we are confident to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We respond with our next hymn.
Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing the closing hymn. Thanks for joining us for our online worship presentation. Remember, you can click that donate button and, and contribute to the ministry at Green Valley Evangelical Lutheran Church. We are getting close. Sunday school, our virtual Sunday school, our virtual Sunday Bible classes start September 13th, just two weeks from today. But you got to register for them. Go to the website and click on the registration for Sunday School. Uh, you can go into uh, Luther's Large Catechism. Under Education, there's a, a request button to be admitted there. You need to be uh, registered because we're going to be using a private Facebook page for the discussion and comments on Luther's Large Catechism, which is our Sunday Adult Bible Study and the Sunday School's teachers' video presentations are going to be on a private YouTube channel that you can only access with the links that will be provided if you have registered your child or children for Sunday School. So don't miss out. We've got a, in, in spite of all the obstacles our community is facing, um, we are intent on offering you uh, relevant, uh, detailed, 
uh, honest Bible study uh, this fall and winter. So be sure to register. Keep safe for this week. I am going to be on uh, vacation a little bit, a couple days next week. And so you're going to have a, a guest preacher, uh, both on the online and also in the, the public worship service, uh, Pastor Peter Kruschel. God be with you today until we see each other again and keep safe.